series and on this one I want to go a little bit more in depth about the unique challenges of treating exotics and kind of going over differences between like avian versus reptile amphibian small mammal and uh, you know talk about different tools a little bit more in depth that you may need or that you think a good exotic veterinary clinic should have so with that out of the way uh, first and foremost Species that you won't see. Oh, primates. 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 That tends to be a popular <laughs> one with exotic vet primates. clinics. Primates. And so I'll be the first to say, y'all, I've worked with primates. I worked with uh, white-handed gibbons, capuchins, uh, squirrel monkeys. I'll be honest, I don't think primates make good pets for pretty much anybody. They do not. I, I don't think so either. That's, that's just me, right? Yes. And unfortunately, they do tend to be surging in popularity. Huh? So can you explain to people why? You know, you're an experienced <laughs> veterinarian. You'll see hundreds of different species that walk through the door. Yeah. Why not primates? So, gosh, there's a lot of reasons, right? So primates to me are they're the husband requirements. Right, even for enclosure space, I think are pretty dramatic. Right. Um, there certainly are some primate security diseases that we can get, and there are some diseases we can give to them. Right, I just think that they are, and, and I, it's not that people can't do it successfully and do it well. I just think that the vast majority have a hard time meeting the their needs. needs, right? Well, it includes things like enrichment, right? And, you know, so foraging. So the things that keep them from having what we call mental stress, right? That people get because they're primates. But trying to manage all that is really hard. And they're a whole, it's a whole different world. When you start to handle those guys, it's a whole, it's like everything on them could potentially grab or get hold of you, right? At least with some of my other species, I have a couple areas, <laughs> I have a couple areas that I have to work with. But you know, primates are just, to me, it's a, it's a big challenge and really, probably a liability right for the clinic and the staff and the owners and it's a, it's a lot of challenges. I think a lot of people don't understand even like like I said when I worked with capuchins people think oh a small cute little monkey that's not dangerous weighs a couple pounds. Y'all they are wicked fast and let me tell you I've been bit by a capuchin it hurts it hurts pretty darn bad yeah. <laughs> and like you said you want to talk about an incredibly dexterous fast animal, prehensile tail, opposable Everything, thumbs. everything's going. Yeah. They get into trouble very quickly. Yep. And like yep. you said, they're, they're really prone to so many health issues just because keeping them properly is really a full-time job. Yeah. You know, when I took care of primates, that was my full-time job. Yeah, that's, it's hard. Like I said, it's not that it can't be done. It's just that I think that's probably maybe best not done. Right. Is that, that seems yeah. like a reason way of putting it. I think that. so. So. And, you know, I definitely don't agree with people keeping any of the great apes, like I've known some right. people that keep chimpanzees. Oof. Yeah. That is an animal that can kill you. Yeah, absolutely. And like you touched on, I think a lot of people don't realize the risk of zoonotic disease. Um, I know when I was working with primates, I was trained that if you have something like a cold sore. Yeah, don't go And there. you're working with little marmosets, for mm. instance, that's enough to kill them. Right, absolutely, yeah. And... You know, it's important to really thoroughly research and understand that this is a lifetime commitment for so many of those primates that you're going to be taking care of a toddler on steroids for life. That's like on a sugar rush. Yeah. It's whole life. Yeah. Yeah, it's a challenge. And then finding medical care, right? That's a, I think you, it, the veterinarians that I know that work on primates, they just, they have just really had to spend a lot of time to get to even the point where they're reasonably good at it, but it's still, it's like nearly impossible to manage them successfully. Yeah. It's super hard. So next group, which is a little bit more pertinent to my world, are your hots or your venomous yeah. animals. Yeah. And it's very challenging. Yeah. You know, we're here, uh, neighbors with Gulf Coast veterinary specialists, they'll see almost anything, even they won't see venomous yeah. animals. Yeah. Yeah, no one wants to see it for the same reason, right? It's no Liability. One, you know, we don't really want to die seeing an animal, right? You can think of a lot of things more fun to do. And, and you know, proper handling, even the, even the best handlers you hear, 
have issues, right? People that handle them on a daily basis. So to be a veterinarian that sees them sometimes, right? You just don't want to not be successful with a hot snake and then have to suffer the consequences. Yeah, that's a, uh, a one-time mistake so, in a lot of cases a life where if you make it, yeah. Yeah. that's going to be the last mistake you may make. Yeah, so, so veterinarians are pretty good about saying, hey, I really don't want to see this. I got a pretty good you know, line on a couple of things. And then some things they'll see that maybe they shouldn't. Yeah. But those guys, I think we are kind of, as a general group, the zoo vets are great with primates, right? The zoo vets are good with hots. That's what they do. Yeah. The private practitioner. Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about exotic veterinarians from a private practice standpoint, y'all are amazing. You get into zoo vets, that's so, like top tier. You have to know how to work a, on anything. That's a little bit crazier, right? <laughs> right. Um, and then another one, I know you've kind of been asked about it before, is getting into some of your larger felids. You know, in Houston, I don't agree with it. Definitely not. But people do keep things like tigers. And <laughs> it's another zoo vet thing, right? Right. Yeah, I was seeing the aquarium animals, and they, when they added tigers, I was not the person for that job. Yeah. Right. So that's another one that having a an enclosure and adequate nutrition and veterinary care. That's a, another whole commitment on keeping these r really large feline. Even some of the smaller ones are still Cervals, probably yeah. Cervals, those are probably yeah. Probably not wow. probably not ideal. Yep. Right. It's another. It's amazing. They look really cute and all, but man, they are another. Yep. They're another challenge in the in themselves. And so I think that leads to something that is a bit more unique to exotic veterinarians as opposed to just people that see dogs and cats is the different moral dilemmas that you can face as an exotic right. practitioner. Um, I know I've experienced my fair share even working here where people will come in with an animal that's not even legal to own. Right. Um, people think if they find an animal, if they find a baby bird, it's fair game, they can keep it. Well, there's laws in place for that. And once again, going back to so many of these animals have such specialized needs that you're doing more harm than good. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people think they're, they're doing the right thing. They're trying to do it out of the kindness of their heart. But, you know, there's a woman in South Texas that found a kitten on the side of the road and it wound up being an ocelot yeah. because they are native down in deep yeah, down right. South Texas. And she was posting about it on Facebook. And sure enough, Texas Parks and Wildlife <laughs> Game Warden showed up at her door. Yeah. Got in big trouble for it. Let me, let me borrow that back from you. Yes. Oh my gosh. And so now that Ocelot lives at Moody Gardens, an ACA facility in Galveston. But, you know, y'all do reach a lot of different moral dilemmas as well. You know, I've seen people come in with cottontail rabbits right. that they're keeping as pets. And, you know, I'm just trying not to kill that poor animal trying to catch it in the room. Right, I mean, right. you try catching a cottontail Stress, rabbit, that's yeah. not the easiest thing in the world. Yeah, and we're not, we're not law enforcement. We have to, we have to keep the clients informed right. of what's both appropriate and inappropriate, but also legal and illegal. Right, and right. so that's, that's that goes back to as an exotic vet, y'all kind of have to stay in the know about the different laws and regulations that are applicable to both wildlife, because you do treat wildlife. We do. Um, but it should be stressed that, you know, like I've worked on raptors with you before. Mm. Licensed falconers that are bringing those raptors in. It's not just Joe Blow off the right. street saying, oh, right. this is my pet peregrine falcon. Right. Um, you know, I also remember treating a barred owl with you from Bear Creek Park. Right. And so, you know, knowing the differences between, between treating wildlife versus a pet exotic kind of comes into play as well for right. somebody like yourself. Right. And so going into things that are a little bit more appropriate to have as exotic <laughs> pets, um, yes. we have some different tools out here. So like you mentioned in the previous video, a gram scale, that's a must, that's yeah. a no brainer in yeah. an exotic clinic. Um, yeah. Oops. And so tell me what it's like kind of day to day, you know, going from seeing maybe a one gram a knoll to a turkey to a Burmese python, you know, you never know what you're going to see, what's going to walk through those doors on any given day. So that's, of course, what makes it fun, right? So that's half the fun. The little tiny, like one gram of is like, well, 
Those are, <laughs> Let so me break out the some, magnifying glass. Some of those guys can be challenging, right? But you know, you, when you see the bigger birds or the bigger reptiles, then you have sometimes a little bit more diagnostics that you can run theoretically. But it is, it is fun seeing everything from pocket pets. But it is a shift of mindset for every species, right? It's a, it's a guinea pig versus a chinchilla versus a lizard versus a bird versus, you know, so it is kind of a shift each time, but it is fun, right? So that kind of stuff keeps us on our toes. Mm -hmm. So I do like doing that. Um, but it, it's a whole, it's a different set. Sometimes you can see what we have in front of us. Sometimes it's a different set of not only knowledge base, but sometimes equipment base. It's like I have knowledge for this and I have equipment for this one. Some equipment works across species and others is very species specific. So can you give us some examples oh, of that? <laughs> what a great segue. So it's interesting on rabbits because of their teeth grow continually. We have a couple of little instruments that we use specifically for working around their teeth and I can't think of really anything else I use those instruments for. So those were purchased really for rabbits. A lot of these things are rabbits and some guinea pigs, some of these speculums for holding lips out of my way so I can see teeth. Cause that's one of their problems that they, that they do battle is sometimes teeth issues. And so some of these instruments will go across species, but trying to get a rabbit's tooth out that's, that's diseased. I think there's a couple things that you have that's just for them. Right. So I have a, you know, there's stuff for, and for so birds. that, that ties it, back into the necessary yes, expense necessary, with exotic yeah. medicine. You know, yeah. these little rabbit tooth elevators, you need them for the rabbits, but they just kind of sit there in the drawer <laughs> otherwise. And I used to go almost every year at, at conferences, I would buy a new retractor of some sort, something to get into, hold an abdomen of a parakeet open. And if I didn't like that one, I'd buy another one. So I have a huge collection of different equipment that either I liked or didn't like moving through each year until I until I find something I like. So you do end up a burning capital, but you're burning, you know, you keep on trying to find, it's like you always want the perfect tool. Yeah, the problem is that there's different, you know, it's a bird, birds are here to, to huge. So, but yeah, you always are looking for the next thing that maybe work a little bit better for whatever species you see at your practice. Which I think helps also maintain that trust with people like myself that come to you with our beloved exotics and we're putting a lot of trust into the, the care that y'all are giving yeah. them. And so when I go to a clinic and, you know, of course I go to this clinic, <laughs> not everybody has that luxury. But when I see all of the tools that you have, like you just touched on, that's literally for one species. Right. That you may not use that, but, you know, a couple times a year or a couple times a month. You never know. Times a week. <laughs> a times a week. Sometimes. We always say in exotics, everything tends to come in spurts. It does. You'll go, you know, months without seeing a hedgehog, and then one week you'll have like 20 hedgehogs come in. I don't know why it, it always happens that way. But this, this is something that is definitely unique. Um, a lot of vet staff are familiar with surgical packs. This is definitely a unique one. So this one, of course, is, is really, it's a lot of ophthalmic equipment. Um, it's really for our little tiny critters, right? It's a, it's a cross species yet again, this one is, um, but your hemostats, your needle holders, your scissors. So we have some scissors that are either T9 C, <laughs> right? But they, the yeah. And a lot of times we're doing surgery on it with magnification. So your, the scissor tip may be tiny without magnification, but with magnification, right? It looks huge, which is nice. So these little ophthalmic packs are my little microsurgery packs. Pretty common as you get into uh, practitioners who do really specialize in exotics. They'll have more specialty packs. They'll almost always have magnification. They'll have special anesthesia monitoring equipment. So there's a lot of things that, uh, the, the more you see exotics, the more equipment you get to get better at it. And the better you get, the more you see. Yeah. Right, and so pretty soon, like I said, everything kind of around us is what I've gotten up over the years yeah. to work on these kids. And so things like this. Now you, I mean, I've used this my fair share of times on dogs and cats, but I've also seen you use it a lot on birds. I as do, well. yeah. So therapeutic laser. So it's a, it's a modality for pain management, for wound healing. Uh, it can be used for neuropathy. So it does a lot of things, um, but we do use the laser um, for exotic species, I've used it on actually on rabbits or hawks and on arthritic issues. So it has a it has value in certain circumstances, right? So cold laser 
versus surgical laser, which is next to you as well, different modality altogether. So that's doing surgery, yeah. right? And I actually got that for working on squamous cells in the oral cavity of birds. So it's one of the modalities that really works well for not curing it necessarily, but for helping manage or, or taking care of some of those squamous cell carcinomas. But it does a lot of stuff, yeah. right? We do I think in it. my time here, uh, I used it most frequently with y'all on sugar glider yes, neuters. Yes, <laughs> sugar glider neuters. It's Makes it the quickest surgery in the world. It is. <laughs> it's spectacular for that, right? So less pain, no bleeding. So it is spectacular for a lot of things. And it's funny, I got it for one, because yeah. I had lost my radiation uh, therapy op options. And so that was the next modality that was best for that particular thing. But I use it for a bunch of stuff now. So dogs and cat surgeries. But, but honestly, I got it for exotic animals is, what, is why I got that. Yeah. Kind and of then my, now something, I'll admit, I didn't get to use it a whole lot here with you, but a couple of times, and I think every time was in birds, is endoscopy. Yeah. So that's something not a lot of vet clinics offer. Yeah. Um, so can you explain why you have it? Because I know you said it's not something you use on a regular you know, basis. Yeah. yeah, so so birds are, it's kind of cool. They're kind of little hollow chambers with some, with their, for lack of a better term, their guts hanging in the middle, right? And so endoscopy, which is kind of in the corner, is a rigid scope. So you see people getting uh, uh, endoscopy of their gut with, with flexible. This is a rigid scope, so you can go in and you can actually see inside the bird and sample, which is super handy without having to open them up. So it decreases your risk, you decrease bleeding, you can get good samples without having to open these guys up, which increases no, your, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, and you almost, you almost, if you're specialized in avian medicine or avian, avian practice, you almost have to have one because you never know when you're gonna have to reach to... and grab it. And you need to have that, you need to have both the equipment, the skill set to do that uh, kind of on demand, yeah. right? And then, Ultrasound. So Ultra that's becoming sound. increasingly popular even in small animal practices. I've seen a lot of dog cat clinics have them. But y'all use that thing all, all the time. <laughs> yeah, so this is our third ultrasound. So we have a fourth one this year. We're going to probably switch this one out. Um, but ultrasound, we use that every day, right? Just about. So this Multiple is, times. Yeah, it's a little ferret adrenal gland. So, But it's ultrasound on really the exotic species is spectacular and part of my drive for an ultrasound is imaging my exotic animal species so that's my prior to kind of this last little bit you ultrasound was an ultrasound you took what you could get right. now you can be more selective and have one that really hits these small small animals both reptiles and birds and small mammals so that's on my short list for this year is to get one that gives me much better imaging very nice but yes ultrasound is is a spectacular modality yeah. for imaging and once again, I think it's important for people to understand that all of these tools that you have are what make you such a great exotic clinic because you can resort to these first before just going in and doing something like an exploratory surgery, yeah. risking the patient, especially when you're getting into these really little guys. I think a lot of people maybe don't even realize what y'all are capable right. of as right. exotic veterinarians. One of the most like mind-blowing surgeries I was a part of was with um, your partner, Dr. Rose. She'll all meet her at another day. Uh, <laughs> was doing a leg amputation on a lovebird. Yeah. Like that just kind of blew my mind that I was in there with her. She did it and he woke up and was on the road to recovery and he actually belongs to uh, yeah. Kristen, one of yeah. your employees here. <laughs> <is a> <laughs> yeah, um, but doing a splenectomy on a ferret, you know, I've, spays on bearded dragons, all kinds of crazy things that people are like, I didn't even know that was possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. imaging and surgery, blood sample. A lot of people don't know you can blood sample, right? All these, all right. down to parakeet size, get right. blood samples and run it on about two drops of blood. You can do a whole profile, which is super handy. And one of the reasons I, it's, one of the reasons it's fun here is that these, the imaging and diagnostic modalities are in hospital. So I'm impatient, right? I know, yeah. I, I, I know, I want to know my answers right now. Get them yes. very quick. Yeah. And I think it gives a peace of mind to the owners as well. Yeah. Because as a pet owner myself, if I'm bringing you an animal that's sick, you're needing to do blood work or imaging. It definitely puts my mind at ease if I can get it that same day. Right. You know, nobody likes waiting, having to send off to a lab <laughs> in California or right. a university and Meanwhile, your animal's just getting worse. Yeah. And you don't have any answers. Yeah, exotics. I'm super impatient on my diagnostic test. I need. Because, like you yeah. touched on previously, you have 
a more finite window of time that you can safely work on them. Right. Um, some other things as well that we don't have in here, like the incubators. Mm. I think that's a must for an exotic clinic to right. have. Um, everything from patient recovery, whether it's a reptile, um, even the, the few amphibians I, I got to work on here as well. Um, birds, definitely small mammals, things like that. But as far as exotic medicine, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand there are still some limitations as well. You know, you're always learning just like medicine mm -hmm. and humans is always evolving. Same thing with you. You know, sure. like you said, you've been boarded since 98. And oh, everything's, exact, up, exactly. everything's exactly the same since then, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> Nothing changed. No, no. <laughs> um, so, for instance, like my mom, she raises poultry. They're her pets. Right. And she would always express her frustration to me about the difficulty in getting them treated and right. not understanding why. Y'all, it wasn't until I started working here and learning from you that there's USDA regulations involved with what you can do for them. Right. And so it's not necessarily a vet just trying to be a jerk not treating your animal, but it kind of puts y'all in a corner of what you can legally and safely do to maintain your livelihood. Right. And hopefully, so when they're here, especially chickens, right? We usually, there's very limited medications that you can use in those legally. And so right. we know yeah. why, but like I said, I didn't know. The whole conversation, yeah. You. So why is that? So oversight, the, the couple of concerns are, of course, antibiotic resistance, right? It's not necessarily antibiotic resistance in the chicken. It's the stool of the chicken on the ground that now gets your microbes resistance. And so the, the restrictions on chickens are for human protection, not for, we don't, it's not that we don't care about chickens, but yeah. if they have a resistance to an antibiotic, we worry about how that impacts humans, right? And so that's the big kicker. And so FARAD is, is the oversight um, organization that you can request, can I use this? We know kind of the list of things we can use. If you're gonna go off label on some stuff, you can ask them and they'll say yes, mm -hmm. or they'll say nope, yeah. right? You can't use it. Yeah. So most of the time we know the kind of small list we can use, but chickens, as popular as they are, if they get sick, we are we really have a narrow selection of choices for managing those guys. Fortunately, they're f fairly hardy, yeah. but it's challenging for us as well, right? We have so we share your mom's, I guess, frustration yes. in that we would love to take some of these chickens that have critical illnesses that we know will respond to certain medications and give it to them, but that medis that medication is restricted, oh. and so we're like, okay, now what are we going to do? So we got to come up with some. Sometimes, you have to be creative. sometimes you have to be creative. That's one of the fun things about exotic animal medicine as well. It's you get to be, you have to be a little bit inventive and a little bit creative for some of these things that come in, right? Love birds with legs that need to come off, right? Yep. What's the best way to get them <laughs> off? Get it quickly, safely, get them back on track. Yep, exactly. And then kind of the final thing I want to touch on on this too is just going back <clears> to the broad <throat> scope of animals you may see in any given day. And the different training that has to be implemented. Because just like you going in and seeing something from a Euromastix to a blue and gold macaw to a cat and then a dog and then a chicken that right. needs to be spayed, that kind of thing. Um, different handling techniques as well. So I think with exotics, like you have to be creative. You have to also have to have patience first and foremost, <laughs> because you know, like, your technician, Jody, friend of mine, she still works here, excellent LVT. She brought up that something she wished a lot of people realized or kept in mind more is these are not domesticated animals. Right. You know, they're not a dog and a cat. Uh, I've had people bring in a blue and gold macaw that's free flighted and they have zero control of that bird and I'm having to chase it around the place trying <laughs> to just get it. Right, right. Um, so finesse is also something I think you really have to have working with exotics yep. because you're not going to be able to handle your little mice the same way that you handle a bird and you're not even going to be able to handle a love bird the same way that you handle a peacock that comes in right and you know like we touched on the one gram of knolls y'all would probably be shocked at how many they see here <laughs> way more way more um, than we thought <laughs> to a reticulated python you right. know i know dr mcneil reached out to me not too long ago about a, a retic that somebody brought in and so just because 
you know, an animal is a reptile, you can't treat all reptiles the same. Yeah. Just because it's a bird, you can't treat all birds the same. You know, I think personally, I was always getting asked which animals were the most difficult. Little teeny tiny guys for me were always the hardest because we have to restrain them <laughs> chameleons. while you're <laughs> trying to <laughs> extend right. them. Like three gram chameleons and little exactly. chameleons are killers, yeah. And, you know, give me the big snakes, the iguanas any day of the week. I'm perfectly fine with them. But the little lovebirds, you know, that was one of the most intimidating mm -hmm. surgeries I was ever part of was that leg amputation mm -hmm. on a lovebird. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, oh, my God, there's a drop of blood. Are you going to die? <laughs> like, you can't afford to lose, but a very small mm -hmm. amount of blood. Right. And right. I know avian surgery is always tricky, but the smaller the patient's, they're a lot more fragile. Right, right. They have a lot less room for error with those guys. Yeah, hemorrhage control. Exactly. Kind of critical, yeah. And I think another point that ties into that is, you know, it's no secret that veterinarians have a high degree of compassion fatigue with good reason. Um, it would kind of break my heart whenever we get people come in and they bring in a little $20 budgie or a $30 guinea pig and they don't want to pay for any kind of treatment because it's a cheap animal. They can just go buy a new one. Right, right. Y'all, once again, please don't get an exotic if that's going to be your mentality about it. You know, I tell everybody I've worked on things from little $10 hamsters to $20,000 black palm cockatoos. They all deserve the same care. And I think a lot of people get frustrated not understanding why the exam for their teeny tiny hmm. little hamster costs the same as it does for, you know, a green wing macaw. Right, right. And so <clears throat> from your standpoint, you know. So it's this, yeah, at the same time, right? You're, so it's, this, it, it's the same time that's put into it, but really it takes the same expertise, right? The green wing macaw, a little harder to handle, right? But the parakeet. Still have to have that same knowledge base, right? So it's the same it's the type. Same organ. Yeah, it's like it's a chihuahua. It's like a chihuahua and a Great Dane, yeah. right? It's the same. The exam costs the same. The exam costs the same. Great, same. great yeah. point. It doesn't yeah. matter what size the dog is. It's the yeah. same care that goes into yeah. it. And I think people lose sight of that with yeah. exotics. It's hard, right? A, a little so like a feeder mouse. People bring them in as pets, right? It's a dollar fifty, yeah. but they love it, right? So it it still takes time to it still takes staff time and doctor time and knowledge to manage their illnesses yeah. like it does all of our other critters. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's, that's a great note to end on is, you know, all exotics are deserving of the same care, yeah. the same level of care, the same great medicine, the same compassion, um, whether it's a, a monetarily cheap animal or, you know, one that's, several thousand dollars i agree yep all right y'all so i think the next segment we'll have if you're willing is probably a more in-depth avian <laughs> specific one maybe with a few uh a patient <laughs> to go with it all right, <laughs> all right doc so we kind of touched on some of these instruments so can you show us off a little bit more in depth so it looks like these look like actually torture devices i promise they are not <laughs> So this actually I use to keep the lips of my rabbits and guinea pigs out of my way when I have them sedate or anesthetize. So there's goes in the mouth and holds it open. And then I use this little one to actually, I use this one to hold their mouth open. So this one holds the lips, this one holds the mouth open. So it's kind of a, it's a way for me to get to those back molars. And then, so funny, it took me years to find what I really like to trim those with, the molars. So cross-cut burrs, I found these about three or four years ago after I talked about buying instruments every year, I bought something every year until I found them, so I've been happy. <laughs> these two structures here, two instruments, are specific for um, root elevation in rabbits. So front tooth, the incisors and peg teeth, and these, this one that's rotating now is for molar, elevating the molar. So rabbits with continually growing teeth. If you've got some that are abscessed or they're creating disease, I use these to kind of elevate the gum and bone away from the tooth so I can get that tooth out. And this is a little, sometimes we can, some rabbits, we can just hand file points off of the molars 
So if I'm just gonna hand file under light sedation, I can do that with this one just as a hand file. So for my horse people, that's uh, yeah. similar floating. to floating teeth. Very similar to floating, yeah. And that's just another little, uh, it's kind of a lip, I call it a lip gag, but it holds the lips out of the way so I can see inside the mouth. The guinea pigs have a lot of redundant cheek tissue. <laughs> and so it keeps the cheeks out of my way. That's really what that's for, it's a cheek mover out of the way. -er. <laughs> nice, huh? And so I know you use these a lot, being an avian surgeon. Yeah, a small have, animal surgeon yeah. in general. These are just some of the instruments that are out there that we use. Some small thumb forceps. I have some. We have some that are smaller than all of these, but this is kind of a standard little small animal or small exotic pack. It's got some little tiny hemostats for us called mosquitoes. So as uh, as we talked about in one of the earlier segments. Hemorrhage control critical. The smaller they are, the less they can lose. So we really, we use special clamps um, and, and small instruments and magnification to manage our tissue handling and hemorrhage control. All right, and so you told us that this was on a ferret earlier. So can you explain what we are looking at here? So this is, uh, so ultrasound gives you kind of a cross section of soft tissue. So this big dark structure is an adrenal gland on a ferret. And you see kind of some red and blue dots down here. We're looking for blood supply. And so the edge of the adrenal gland over here has a blood supply, a little vessel to it. But the adrenal gland itself doesn't have enough flow to show up on this color flow Doppler. So we, we get this up, we measure it, we, and uh, we use that to determine what kind of treatment we're gonna do. So it, it supports a diagnosis in ferrets of an adrenal tumor. And that requires specific therapy. So that's the purpose of that particular, this particular image is to, to diagnose an adrenal tumor in a ferret.